all of you to Graduate Chapel this morning. And this chapel service was put together and designed by Dr. Roy's Christian worship class. And so we have a lot to share with you, but we want to acknowledge going forward that it's not about what we have put together. Uh, it's, about, it's about our Lord and Savior. Would you stand as we begin in a call to worship this morning, reading responsively um, the text of Psalm 47. So you read the yellow text. Clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with cries of joy. For the Lord Most High is awesome, the great King over all the earth. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing to him a song God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of the God of Abraham. The kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. So we enter a brief time of confession. Now I ask that you all would join me in reading the yellow text. Confess to you, Father, and to one another, and to the communion of saints that we have sinned by our own fault, in thought, in word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We confess to you our failure and negligence to seek your wisdom and strength. We confess to you, Lord, our patience and distrust of your lordship over our lives, your church, and the whole world. As to you, Lord. We have not used our influence and authority to serve others, but to serve ourselves. Confess to you, Lord. We have treated others as instruments for our purposes and glory, spurning the justice that you demand. Confess to you, Lord. We have not always obeyed your command to pray for the leaders of our nation. Confess to you, Lord. Accept our repentance, Lord, for the wrongs we have done, for our blindness to our arrogance, and for our hearts that are heedless of the authority you have graciously placed in our lives. Accept our repentance, Lord. I invite you all to take a moment of silence in silent confession now. God, our Father, as we confess these things to you, we rest in the assurance of your forgiveness. The forgiveness that has been won for us by your Son and our Lord, Jesus Christ, the King of kings, whose current reign and coming consummated reign is our joy and not our judgment, because he is also the one who reigned on the cross. In his royal, regal name, we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning will include three different passages. Um, so if you would turn your Bibles with me to Proverbs, the 28th chapter, verses 1 through 6. And then in that same chapter, Proverbs 28, verses 28, through the second verse of chapter 29. And then finally, Proverbs chapter 29 again, verses 26 through 27. And you're hearing the written word of God. Proverbs 28, verses 1 through 6. The wicked flee, though no one pursues. But the righteous are as bold as a lion. When a country is rebellious, it has many rulers, but a ruler with discernment and knowledge maintains order. A ruler who oppresses the poor is like a driving rain that leaves no crops. Those who forsake instruction praise the wicked, but those who heed it resist them. Evildoers do not understand what is right, 
but those who seek the Lord understand it fully. Better the poor whose walk is blameless than the rich whose ways are perverse. I'll turn to Proverbs chapter 28, verse 28, and through chapter 29 and verse 2. When the weak derives to power, people go into hiding. But when the weak to perish, the righteous thrive. Whoever remains stiff-necked after many rebukes will suddenly be destroyed with a remedy. When the righteous thrive, the people rejoice, and the weak through, the people grow. Proverbs 29, 26-27. Many seek an audience with a ruler, but it is from the Lord that one gets justice. The righteous detest the dishonest, the wicked detest the upright. This is God's word. Pray with me if you would. Father, it's clear you have much to say regarding righteousness and against oppression. We know you as the defender of the weak. You're the great king of justice, and our eyes are on you. We pray for illumination as we dwell on your word this hour, that you would open our eyes to the riches that lay in these verses. Give focus to our minds. Grant grace to Dr. Roy as he proclaims your word. Grant grace to us as we receive it. Amen. Well, good morning. It's great to be with you here in chapel this morning as we gather to praise our God and to open his word together. And I do want to say how happy and proud I am to be with my friends and colleagues from the Christian worship class who worked hard in planning and leading this chapel service. We are continuing this morning in our spring chapel series from the book of Proverbs. And our text for this morning is chapters 28 and 29 of the book. And one of the things that we will see this morning is something that we've been noting throughout the book as a whole. The wisdom of Proverbs, beginning with and shaped by the fear of the Lord, is amazingly broad and comprehensive. It applies to all areas of life. Sisters and brothers, no matter what dimension of life you are considering, no matter what you're experiencing, there is wisdom from Proverbs for you. And that is certainly true for us as Americans in this season of our national life. I don't need to remind any of you that we are in the midst of a presidential election campaign. And my goodness, what an election season it has been. With out-of-the-box candidates, unusual at times distressing proposals and tone, protests, even violence at campaign events, talk of contested conventions, and the list goes on and on and on. Just two days ago, the state of New York voted in its primary election, and the pundits are all over the meaning and implications of the results for the winners, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, and also for the losers. But the point is that as Americans, we are thinking and debating these days about political leadership. What kind of person we would like to have rule our country as our next president? And friends, the book of Proverbs as a whole, and our text in particular, has lots to say to us about this. Our text for this morning is in the midst of a larger section of the book of Proverbs that consists of chapters 25 through 29. This is a Solomonic collection of Proverbs as indicated by Proverbs 25.1, which describes them as, quote, more Proverbs of Solomon, compiled by the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah. And we know that this collection ends at the end of chapter 29, because Proverbs 30, verse 1, describes what comes next as the sayings of Agur. So these chapters, 25 through 29, are a distinct section of the book. And within this collection, our two chapters for this morning are marked as a distinct subsection by the way they're framed. 
If you look at the first and the last verses of our text, Proverbs 28, 1 and 29, 27, you'll see that both of them contain a contrast between the righteous and the wicked. These antithetical Proverbs frame our section as a whole. In them, the righteous and the wicked are contrasted, as Bruce Waltke has suggested, in terms of their psychological stance towards life, and then in terms of the values and commitments of their hearts. Look with me at the first of these framing Proverbs. Proverbs 28, verse 1 states, The wicked flee, though no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. The psychological insecurity and paranoia of the wicked are likened to warriors who are so fearful that they flee even though there's no enemy pursuing them. By contrast, however, the righteous are characterized by confidence and security and boldness. They're likened to a lion, the king of beasts, who confronts his enemies and emerges triumphant. Paradoxically, because the wicked don't fear God, they live in fear of other people, always looking over their shoulders out of fear of real or imagined enemies. Even though at one level it appears that they are out of touch with reality, fleeing with no one pursuing. At a deeper level, I'd suggest they are in fact living in light of ultimate reality. You see, being an enemy of God is not at all a secure way to live. Living as a wicked person is filled with danger. Now, and in the future. But by contrast, because the righteous do fear God, they don't need to fear other people. Rather, they are confirmed in their own consciences. They are fortified by the promises of their God and Scripture. And so they're strengthened to face all kinds of distress and faith. They are, as the text says, bold as a lion. And that, too, is deep reality. Now, the other framing proverb, the end of our section, Proverbs 29, 27, describes the contrast between the righteous and the wicked by highlighting what they hate and implicitly what they love. Verse 27 says, the righteous detest the dishonest, or as the ESV renders it, the unjust person, but the wicked detest the upright. You see, in the mind and heart of the righteous, those who are dishonest and unjust and wicked are literally, the text says, an abomination. So in tune are the righteous with their God that their hearts are in accord with his. They, they understand the grave wrong that is injustice and dishonesty. And they hate it. And those who perpetrate it. But how different are the wicked? For them, the abomination is the upright in their way of life. So distorted are their minds and hearts that their values are the complete opposite of God's. Friends, the contrast between the righteous and the wicked could not be painted in stronger terms. Both in their stance towards life and in the values and commitments of their hearts, the righteous and the wicked are strikingly different. And these framing proverbs offer to us what we have seen throughout the book, the choice between two very different ways to live. In much of the book of Proverbs, these two ways have been described in terms of the contrast between wisdom and foolishness. But here in chapters 28 and 29, these two ways are described in terms of the contrast between righteousness and wickedness. Well, by framing these chapters in terms of this contrast between righteous and wicked, I want to suggest that our author is telling us that everything else that's discussed in these chapters should be seen in terms of this contrast. Now, there are a lot of topics addressed in these chapters, and all of them make sense when seen in terms of the difference between the righteous and the wicked. And that's true of one of the key emphases of these chapters that we are going to look at this morning the nature and function of rulers. It's a very prominent theme in our text. 
It's mentioned in one way or another in 13 different verses in our two chapters. Believe me, this theme of rulers is one that's worthy of our attention, especially now. So let's consider together what Proverbs 28 and 29 tells us about righteous and wicked rulers. Now, in the time remaining for us this morning, I want to point out from our text four principles about rulers and the way they rule. But before we get to these four principles, I, I want to point out one factor about the ancient Israelite society to which these Proverbs were originally addressed that can have a big impact in the way that we contemporary people hear and apply them to our lives. And that is the fact that ancient Israel was a theocratic nation, one in which society was structured and life was lived in a much more holistic way than we experience in our contemporary society. In particular, we Americans very consciously separate church and state. And so political rulers don't function in the realm of religion, and religious re leaders don't function in the realm of the political, with a few exceptions, maybe especially in our campaign. But in theocratic Israel, things were much more unified. Now, the implication that we should draw from this is that these proverbs that speak of rulers largely in governmental terms, they apply to us not only in terms of our own government and its rulers, but also in terms of leaders in the church or in other ministries, leaders in families, leaders in business or education or culture in its various forms. Friends, the four principles that we're going to see this morning from Proverbs 28 and 29, they have application to all of us wherever we may be called by God to exercise leadership. So with that, let's look at these four principles. The first, very simply, is this, that rulers have power. And the way they rule has huge consequences for their people. Rulers have power, for good or for ill. Now, this is taught in several proverbs that explicitly utilize the righteous, wicked contrast. Look, for example, at Proverbs 28, 12. When the righteous triumph, there is great elation. But when the wicked rise to power, people go into hiding. The parallelism here makes it clear that the righteous who are said to triumph are, in fact, righteous rulers. They are said in antithetical contrast to the wicked who rise to power. The point is clear, is it not? Rulers have great power and much influence over those they lead, whether the impact is one that leads to elation when it's righteous rulers who rule or one that makes people go into hiding to escape from the influence of wicked rulers. The thought's repeated in Proverbs 28, 28. And the first line here repeats the second line from 28, 12. When the wicked rise to power, people go into hiding. But when the wicked perish, the righteous thrive. We'll finally look at Proverbs 29, 2. When the righteous thrive, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. Friends, if you are called by God to exercise leadership, whether that be in the realm of national or state or local politics, and I hope that some of you in this room will be called to that kind of vocation because God knows we need righteous political leaders. But whether your leadership will be in the realm of the political or whether it will be in the church or in fields of counseling or education or business or in your own family, you need to know that your, your leadership matters. How righteously or how wickedly you lead matters tremendously to your people. And if you and I have a voice in who it is that will lead us and rule over us, as is the case in this current election season, please know, brothers and sisters, it really matters who we choose. When the righteous thrive, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people groan. Okay, well, here's a second principle from our text concerning rulers, and that is that righteous rulers govern with wise discernment. 
A discernment that comes from seeking God and his instruction. And here I'd like for us to look at Proverbs 28, verses 2 through 5. In Proverbs 28, 2, we see our model of a righteous ruler, one the text calls a ruler with discernment and knowledge. This is a ruler who knows God and his will, who has wise discernment to apply these principles and values to the many varied, complex, and frankly, oftentimes very bewildering circumstances that every leader has to confront. But this kind of ruler and this kind of stability and order that he or she will bring is set in contrast with the chaos and instability of a rebellious nation. Look at verse 2. When a country is rebellious, it has many rulers. And I think that refers probably both to the chaotic succession of ruler after ruler after ruler in a rebellious country, oftentimes owing to assassinations or coups, but probably also to the reality that it will take a larger bureaucracy to ride herd on a rebellious people. When a country is rebellious, it has many rulers, but a ruler with discernment and knowledge maintains order. Once again, we see the powerful impact that rulers have for good or for ill. We see the latter in verse 3. Look at verse 3. A ruler who oppresses the poor is like a driving rain that leaves no crops. Tyrannical, oppressive rulers are so damaging so exploitative, especially to the poor and the needy, that they leave very little in their wake. The oppressive ruler is like a driving rain that leaves no crops. Friends, the irony is striking, isn't it? I mean, the normal function of rain is to enable crops to grow and to flourish. And in the same way, the normal function of rulers is to enable all their people, including the poor and the helpless, to flourish. Just as the driving rain ends up being destructive, so are oppressive leaders. But the question is, what accounts for the difference between wise and discerning leaders on the one hand and harsh, oppressive, tyrannical rulers on the other hand? Look with me at verses 4 and 5. Those who forsake instruction praise the wicked, but those who heed it resist them. Evildoers do not understand what is right, but those who seek the Lord understand it fully. If you take these two verses together, they contrast those who forsake instruction, and in Hebrew that's Torah, with those who seek the Lord. Sisters and brothers, the key contrast between righteous and wicked rulers has to do with where they seek their wisdom and knowledge. Do they seek it from God? Do they seek to be guided and molded by his Torah? Or do they forsake instruction in the God who is its source? Friends, wise rulers, discerning rulers, righteous rulers, seek their wisdom from God's instruction. And now to be sure, the issues faced by rulers are complex and difficult. And wisdom is needed from multiple sources, many of which are available by God's common grace, even to rulers who aren't consciously seeking their wisdom from God. And that's valuable. But only God can shape a ruler's fundamental values so they reflect the priorities of his kingdom. Only God can mold the identity of rulers so they're increasingly free from the inner need to prove themselves by winning at all costs. To build themselves up by tearing others down. Only a deep, abiding trust in the God who is the sort of, source of the deepest wisdom of all can give rulers the humility and the peace and the confidence to take the needed risks to rule wisely and justly and righteously. Friends, the most discerning of leaders are those who need Know their need of God's wisdom and seek his instruction consciously and intentionally. They are the kind of rulers we need to be. They are the kind of rulers we need to seek. Well, third principle builds on what we've seen, just seen. 
And that is that righteous rulers resist the temptation to profit personally from the way they exercise their power. Righteous rulers resist the temptation to profit personally from the way they exercise their power. Rather, they're more concerned with what they can give to those they lead than what they can take from them. Look at Proverbs 28, 15, and 16. Like a roaring lion or a charging bear is a wicked ruler over a helpless people. A tyrannical ruler practices extortion. But one who hates ill-gotten gain will enjoy a long reign. Here again, it's a contrast between a righteous and a wicked ruler. The wicked ruler is a fierce and fearful tyrant compared with a roaring lion or a charging bear out for destruction. And this destruction is described in verse 16 as extortion, wickedly extracting the meager resources of helpless people for the personal gain of the leader. Far from being concerned about the welfare of the people, especially those who have the least. Wicked rulers are concerned first and foremost with what they can gain personally from the people. How different is the righteous ruler described in verse 16 as one who hates ill-gotten gain? Put in other language, righteous rulers are servants, far more interested in making others flourish than they are in accumulating for themselves power and wealth and luxuries. Righteous rulers are those who follow in the footsteps of the Son of Man, who did not come to be served, but to serve. Another statement of this principle can be found in Proverbs 29.4. By justice, a king gives a country stability, but those who are greedy for bribes tear it down. Rulers who are, in the end, more interested in personal enrichment than they are in just and compassion and even self-sacrificial service end up tearing down the very country they're called to lead. The pathway to a long reign, a stable reign, an accomplished reign, is not to seek one's own personal enrichment at the expense of others. It's rather to seek the welfare of all the people. Again, sisters and brothers, this is not just for political and governmental leaders. Every pastor, every parent, every business leader, every leader of every kind is called by Jesus Christ to be a servant, to resist the temptation to enrich oneself, but rather to serve others in the love of Christ. Well, the fourth and final principle that I'd like to highlight is this. Righteous rulers evidence their righteousness by the just and fair and compassionate way they treat the poor and the needy in their midst. Say that again. Righteous rulers evidence their righteousness by the just and fair and compassionate way they treat the poor and the needy in their midst. Now, we've already alluded to this principle. Remember back in Proverbs 28.3, where the ruler who oppresses the poor is likened to that driving rain that leaves no crops in his wake. Or or remember Proverbs 28.15, like a roaring lion or a charging bear is a wicked ruler over a helpless people. See, the truest sign of the wicked, the righteousness or the wickedness of a ruler is the way that they treat those who are helpless those who don't have the resources to exercise power in their own right. And Proverbs 28, 15 is very clear. It is a wicked thing when rulers treat helpless people like roaring lions and charging bears. Friends, helpless people are indeed helpless when their rulers are wicked, when they are not constrained by the heart of their God to serve and aid and empower the helpless. We see the contrast again in verse, Proverbs 29, 7. The righteous care about justice for the poor, but the wicked have no such concern. Now, that proverb is stated in general terms. Genuine care for justice for the poor is the hallmark of the righteous, no matter who they might be. 
But in our context, in these chapters, with the emphasis on rulers, the implication is clear, right? Righteous rulers care about justice for the poor. They act on their behalf. Wicked rulers, on the other hand, no such concern. Some could care less. Others find different priorities and in the end distract them from the key concern of the righteous, which is justice for the poor. If we keep going further in chapter 29, we come to Proverbs 29, 14. If a king judges the poor with fairness, his throne will be established forever. Judging the poor with fairness. Righteous rulers do this because they know the truth of the preceding verse, verse 13, which states the poor and the oppressor have this in common. The Lord gives sight to the eyes of both. Now, this is a truth we've seen before back in Proverbs 22, 2, which says rich and poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. And it's the fundamental truth of the common humanity of both rich and poor, both the oppressed and the oppressors, that galvanizes righteous rulers into action. It's the fundamental equality of rich and poor in the sight of God, their makers, that makes the state of the poor, who don't have the kind of resources needed for full inclusion and full participation in the common life of the community, such a tragedy. That's why righteous rulers... Righteous kings are those, described as those who will judge the poor with fairness. They're not overly impressed by or beholding to the rich and the powerful. They are advocates for those most in need. And when they do this, these righteous rulers are acting on behalf of their God. You see, he is the ultimate righteous ruler. And his righteousness is expressed by the way he loves justice, that's Psalm 99, verse 4. Or the way he exercises kindness and justice and righteousness on the earth, Jeremiah 9, 24. So committed is Yahweh to righteousness and justice that Psalm 89, verse 14 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. So when righteous rulers seek justice and righteousness for those who need it the most, when they judge the poor with fairness, they are acting in God's name in accordance with his heart. And the justice they dispense ultimately comes from God. Look at Proverbs 29, 26. Many seek an audience with the ruler, but it is from the Lord that one gets justice. But and sisters, let me dwell on this for just a bit more. What is so clear from these chapters is that the defining characteristic of righteous rulers, the defining characteristic of godly rulers, those who govern and lead with wisdom grounded in the fear of the Lord, is not the way they treat the powerful and the rich and the influential. It's not the way they treat donors or potential donors. It's not the way you or I seek our own prestige, our own advancement, our own power, our own agenda. I mean, the temptations are great. Whether we are leading in the political realm or in the church or in culture in so many different ways, the temptations are great to focus on those with influence. I mean, they're the ones that can help you, right? They can help you get elected or reelected. They can help you accomplish your agenda, they can make your life easier. They can enrich you in so many ways. But brothers and sisters, they are not the ones that need you the most. Righteous rulers are called to serve the poor, the marginalized, the excluded, the helpless, whether they are immigrants or refugees, the unemployed and underemployed, people of color who often, all too often live in pockets of poverty, religious others, Sexual minorities. Jesus tells us in Matthew 25 that the truest test of our devotion to him is the way we serve those with the fewest resources. These are the ones in society and in the church that righteous, godly rulers are called to serve above all. So let me sum up as we close. In Proverbs 28 and 29, we've seen four key principles 
about the nature and function of rulers. Number one, rulers have power. And the way they rule has great consequences for the people they lead. Number two, righteous rulers govern with wise discernment. A discernment that comes from seeking God and his instruction. Number three, righteous rulers resist the temptation to profit personally from the way they exercise their power. And finally, righteous rulers exercise um, evidence their righteousness by the just and fair and compassionate way they treat the poor and needy in their midst. Friends, if God in his grace gives you the privilege to lead in any way, this is the kind of ruler you should be. And these are the kind of leaders we should seek and choose to rule over us. Amen and amen. We're now going to respond to the proclaimed word of God with a time of individual prayer for our leaders. We will pr first pray for the leadership at Trinity, then the leadership of our churches, and finally the leadership of the countries we all come from. So please take this time first to pray for the leadership at Trinity. Now please pray for the leaders of your church. Finally, pray for the leadership of this country or your own country of origin. We will now turn to a time of call and response as we read through the Beatitudes and reflect on the kingdom values that Christ our King instituted. Please read aloud together the portion in yellow after I read the lines in white. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Please stand to receive the commission and banana and the benediction. As you go and rule what the Lord has placed under your care, and as you search for faithful rulers on this earth, pursue discernment and knowledge for the sake of order. Seek the Lord and be blameless and let righteousness bring people out of hiding with great rejoicing. Oppose the reign of wickedness which causes people to groan and hide. Preserve justice to keep stability and peace and have compassion on the poor. Abstain from greed and lack of concern for those in need. And place your hope and trust in the one with perfect justice and compassion, who is our God, the blessed and only ruler the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion forever. Now, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace.